Thanks very much, Charlotte. Do keep your Bibles open. You'll find an outline of where we're heading, hopefully somewhere in your hands. Now, Somerset House on the Strand is currently hosting a Rwanda in Photographs exhibition. I went along this week. And you'll find there sobering reminders of the genocide that took place 20 years ago. But the focus of the exhibition is more on the vibrancy, the colour that you'll find in the Rwanda of today. The exhibition is called Death Then, Life Now. Which obviously this weekend can't help but remind us of the events of the first Easter. Death leading to life. That story resonates, doesn't it? and uh, has widespread appeal today because many face deep trials and difficulties but with the hope of better things to come. But then again the world might say hang on that's not as insightful as you might think and it's true yesterday I watched the Disney film Frozen with my children and uh, sure enough in the film events take a turn for the worse but it all works out okay in the end. Is that all Easter is? Is it yet another story, if moving, of the ideal scenario we wish for, of a happy ending? Or is there more substance to it? After all, in our world today, what does Easter say to the atrocities that still take place, to the many wars going on around our world? And on the personal level, bank holiday weekend, great, that's fun for Easter. But come Tuesday and normal life resumes, the strains at work or college, in our neighbourhoods, at home, in the family. For most, the Easter weekend will be quickly forgotten, in fact, if it was ever noticed at all. But as we've been thinking this evening, two millennia ago, a man died and was buried. He then rose again to life, witnessed by hundreds Surely that really does change everything. It's not a fairy tale, it's a historical event, but it must matter. But how, we ask? Because after all, it was a long time ago. A lot happened since then, but nothing like that. And everyone has died in the intervening period. What difference does Easter make to us and to our world? Well, we find the answer in a place we might not have expected it. Psalm 110 was written not after Easter, looking back, but a thousand years before. It's one of the most quoted chapters from the Old Testament in the New, consistently used to describe and explain the significance of what had happened. You see, God had planned Jesus' coming, his life, death and resurrection a long time in advance. It was the heart of his plan for the history of the whole world. And Psalm 110 shows us how that is. The message of the psalm is very simple. It's that the living Lord Jesus is enthroned as God's king. The living Lord Jesus is enthroned as God's king. Look again how the psalm begins. A psalm of David. The Lord says... To my Lord. Well, that first line is easy enough. The author is David, the king of Israel. But then he speaks of these two lords. And we just need to be clear who he's talking about. The first lord there, notice, is in capitals. It's referring to Yahweh, the personal name of the creator, Lord God, who'd revealed himself in Old Testament history. And then there's another lord who David calls my Lord. Now that's a little bit puzzling because David was the king of Israel. There was no one greater than him. So in this psalm, it must be that David is looking forward to the greater king to come, the one he knew God had promised that would come, called the Messiah or the Christ. And sure enough, Jesus came as that long-awaited king who died and rose again. The question is, though, where is Jesus now? Today, what is he doing? And that's where Psalm 110 fills us in. Look again at the first verse. Remembering now it's speaking of Jesus. So the Lord God says to the Lord Jesus, David Lords, sit at my right hand 
until I make your enemies your footstool. The point is, the living Jesus is now established as God's king over all. Don't misunderstand, God has always been in complete control of the world he's made, but with Jesus' enthronement, God's plan is coming to its fruition. He has his king in place. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Abdullah al-Thini was appointed prime minister of Libya. I wonder, were you aware of that? And even if you were, I'm guessing it hasn't really impacted your life all that much since. And many today around us assume that, yes, they know people say Jesus is the king, but that's the kind of king they think he is. That is one that's not really involved in our lives, that everything pretty much goes on as it would do anyway. There's not much difference. And we're going to see from Psalm 110 that the consequences of Jesus' enthronement are dramatic and far-reaching for each of us and for the whole world. So for a start, let's see that Jesus, God's king, is the king who rules. Now, Queen Elizabeth is a constitutional monarch. That means that we could describe her as a sovereign who reigns but doesn't rule. Think of Al Thini, that new Prime Minister of Libya. He actually resigned this week, did you know that? So after a week or so in power, he'd had enough and he quit. Now other kings and rulers last a little bit longer, but again, in the end, they're overthrown or they die, but not this king. He's been there 2,000 years and he is not going anywhere because the Lord God has told him, verse 1, to sit at his right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, what does a footstool bring to your mind? Well, with a leisurely bank holiday Monday ahead, you might be dreaming of taking it easy, put your feet up. That's not what Psalm 110 is talking about. It's a military picture. Back in the ancient Near East, a victorious king would place his foot on the neck of his conquered foe. It shows the complete subjugation of those he has defeated. And that will be the outcome for all who oppose King Jesus. In the meantime, verse 2. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. You see, verse 2 knows what our world is like today. Jesus has been enthroned, but there are still plenty of people living hostile to him. That is, there are the atheists, the secularists, the other religions, the don't knows, the don't cares. But all the same, if they deny that Jesus is Lord and King, trying to reject his rule over him, they are his enemies. And we, as Jesus followers, feel outnumbered, don't we? We look around. There are moments where we feel all these others are getting the upper hand. It looks like they are the ones setting the agenda. Verse 2 reminds us the scepter belongs to Jesus. He rules. Nothing can or will ever change that. Now, we may not understand why everything happens in our world as it does, but in all that, we need never fear that it's out of control because the throne of the universe remains firmly occupied. So remember that everywhere you go this week, whether it's the office or the classroom, whether you go overseas, wherever it is that might feel like to us as enemy territory, there Jesus is in charge. He rules. And with that, he is the king worth serving, verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. What's the date today? What would you say? It is, of course, the 20th of April 2014. But a plenty in our society now insist on saying 2014 CE, when they should know far better. Common era. Psalm 110 says that is laughable. It's pathetic. Because look, verse 3 puts it, this is the day of your power, his power, the king 
is in power. It is 2014 AD, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. Jesus reigns. Whatever people might want to write after the date doesn't change again who is on the throne. But if we've realised that, how should we respond? Well, this verse tells us the king is not after your Sundays or mine. He's not after our lip service. He doesn't want a bit of our money or our time. No, verse 3, his people will offer themselves. Jesus is not so much after what we've got. He wants us all that we are, given to him. We heard an example of that, didn't we, in our reading in Mark's Gospel. Jesus and his disciples are there in the temple treasury, watching as these donations are made. The rich give large sums, and then a poor widow puts in two small copper coins, almost worthless. But what's the verdict of the king? Well, he says the rich give from their abundance, their leftovers, doesn't really matter how much it is, he's not interested. But of the widow, he said, out of her poverty, she has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. That is, she gave herself her whole life. And she is the model for us. King Jesus is for anyone, so long as they offer themselves without holding anything back. And notice, and this the world does not understand, verse 3, the people will offer themselves freely. They'll choose to do it. Now, we all serve something or someone. Those around us who resist Jesus are nevertheless serving something else. But of course, that won't deliver for them what they hope. Look instead to this king, to King Jesus. Remember his life on earth, the actions, what he did, his words, his death for others, his resurrection, defeating death. Now there is a king that is worth serving. So his people realise that and they serve him freely with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. Now, we've seen already that this psalm has military overtones, and verse 3 is talking about serving in the king's army. There is a battle going on. The warfare is not physical, it's spiritual, which means it's all the more real. So we could ask, what is it like for me to give myself to serve in this battle? Well, first of all, I know who my king is. I recognise that his word goes, it's supreme. So again, wherever I find myself, even this week, I remember I'm the servant of the king. And so what he has said goes on every issue, whatever his enemies, that is those around me, might think. And in particular, of course, this army is there to spread his kingdom, to speak of him, to tell the world that there is a king on the throne and that all should recognise this and freely submit to him. That is God's plan for how this kingdom will advance around the world. And now, 3,000 years after the psalm, 2,000 years after Jesus, we can see that it's worked. Literally millions from around the world have heard that Jesus is on the throne and have offered themselves willingly to serve him and continue to do so. You can spot those serving this king because we find They have a uniform. Did you spot that? Middle of verse 3. Your people offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. Holy means quite simply set apart. And we can understand that here. We're set apart for the king, for his army. And we live, therefore, like our king. We live his way. So this psalm is saying that his people will be seen because they live the kind of life the king lived when he was here on earth. I wonder how hearing that makes us feel. It's where we've brought up short, isn't it? Yes, we've realised Jesus is alive. He's the king. We understand he's worthy of all that I am. We even want to serve him. But hearing this, we're aware that we have failed. 
we don't reach that standard. We haven't lived set apart for him. In fact, if we're honest, we've lived at times on the other side as if we were his enemies. And so we must ask, what now? Here in London, people worry, don't they, about money, housing, relationships, career, health. We could go on. The pressures of the world are there and they crowd in on us. But if we've realised Jesus is king over all, the issue above all is how can I be acceptable to him? How can I have these holy garments when I know I've lived as his enemy? At this point in Psalm 110, we would despair. But there is even more to this king for us to grasp. Here is a king who is priest forever. <clears throat> Did you see that article in the Evening Standard a couple of weeks ago? where an East London imam gave his verdict on Christianity. He had some positive things to say, but he gave his view that, quote, you don't need someone else to die for your sins. Or then take Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York. This week he announced this. I am telling you that if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Well, I take it we wouldn't express our view of ourselves quite as brazenly as that, but I wonder, is there a hint of that in our hearts? Or have we realised that such sentiments can only be expressed by those who have failed to realise who is ruling the universe? No one, including any of us here tonight, has served King Jesus as we should. None of us is fit to enter his glorious kingdom. That is our greatest problem, as it is for all humanity, about which we can do nothing. So what can be done? Well, in the Old Testament, to address this problem of sin, God gave the system of priests and sacrifices. And that system pointed to a solution, but... It showed itself to be, in and of itself, ineffective. You see, our problem runs so deep, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away our sin. Priests in the Old Testament, well, they were themselves sinful, and then they died. But with that in mind, look now to where Psalm 110 turns in verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now here's a confusing verse. For a start, did you notice God's king is now described as a priest? But according to the Old Testament law, that was actually impossible. You see, priests came from the tribe of Levi, whereas kings in David's line came from the tribe of Judah. King couldn't be the priest. A priest couldn't be the king. So what's going on? Well, having said that, there was one precedent for one who was both king and priest. Even before that law was given, long before, there was one with this dual role called Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is an enigmatic figure. He makes only one brief appearance in Genesis 14. But David, here in Psalm 110, foresees that one day, when God's ultimate king comes... He must be one like Melchizedek, a priest, but a greater priest, who could actually deal with this problem of sin. But how? How did Jesus do that? When the genocide began in Rwanda in 1994, the Tutsi people desperately needed to get out to safety. There was an unarmed UN military observer in the capital Kigali. He was a Captain Mbaye Diagne. He was from Senegal. He had left behind his wife and young children. When he realised what was going on about him, he resolved to do whatever he could to rescue these Tutsis. On one occasion, he stood in the way of a priest who was about to shoot a lady taking refuge in his church and made him back down. On another occasion, he encountered militiamen dragging people off a lorry. 
He was unarmed, but he accosted them and said, I will not allow you to harm them. You'll have to kill me first. It's been estimated now that he saved the lives of over 500 people at enormous risk to his own life. But when the trouble had first flared up in Rwanda, Captain Diagne's orders had been, only observe, do not intervene. There are hundreds alive in Rwanda today because he was determined to intervene. And in the end, he himself was killed. Nine days, it turns out, before he was due to return home to his family. Jesus, seeing the world, <clears throat> saw a place full of enemies, those who are hostile to him personally. And yet he saw, therefore, they were in very great danger. There was nothing they could do. But Jesus didn't just observe that. He intervened. He entered our world as this long-awaited king. And he came to serve the very ones who hated him. He did what was needed at such great cost. At long last, he offered the perfect, effective sacrifice for sin which was himself. And it's on the basis of that sacrificial death on the cross, he is now our priest, one after the order of Melchizedek, who gives us access to God. There are two wonderful words you'll see there in verse 4, forever. You see now, Jesus will be there for us always, come what may. When we are conscious yet again of our unworthiness, of the many ways we have failed to serve the rightful king of the universe, we must remember again that king is also our priest. You see, our sin does not prevent us from serving him. He's taken care of it once and for all. He's that priest we need, and that's the way it's going to stay. Look, even the Lord himself, verse 4, has sworn this and will not change his mind. We are completely secure. Jesus is also, with that, the king who executes judgment. So Psalm 110 has told us already, Jesus rules today, he's the king. But we look around and we feel, well, it doesn't look like that. Listen to the news, all the injustice, power, people oppressed, by those ruling over them. Christians often bear the brunt of it simply because they serve their rightful king. Christians get sidelined, mistreated, even killed. The perpetrators of all this seem to get away with it scot-free. But look down now to how Psalm 110 continues in verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. So from his throne, Jesus is now looking and sees everything that happens in our world. He is angry with this rebellion and with all the pain, hurt, violence and death that follows. And there is a day when that anger, that wrath will be poured out. So Kim Jong-un of North Korea, beware. Bashar al-Sadad of Syria, Vladimir Putin watch out. And Barack Obama and David Cameron and all the rest will also stand before this king. World rulers can seem, can't they, so powerful, so strong. They themselves think they can do as they please. Well, one day that illusion will be shattered. There'll be no doubt then who holds the scepter. All who oppose God's king, however great they might appear now, will face his wrath. And it won't just be a day for the rulers, verse 6. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Now today in Cardiff is Judgment Day. That is the name they've given to the uh, encounters in the Millennium Stadium. The four top teams are playing a couple of matches, taking each other on, and the hype is huge. I wouldn't have minded being there, but as you can see, I have missed it. But the true Judgment Day is coming.
coming, and not one will miss it. There'll be nowhere to hide and no escape. All will face this true ruler of the universe. And for those who on that day remain enemies of Jesus, it will be terrifying. As verse 6 puts it, the nations of the world full of corpses. But Psalm 110 is telling us this in advance. That day has not yet arrived. And so this Easter, everyone in the world, including each of us, has a choice. And whatever the history of our rebellion, which is there, we can today offer to give ourselves freely to this king. And if we do that, he will take care of us now and forever, even on judgment day. But all who choose to continue to serve some other master will simply face the consequences because the king executes judgment. The psalm ends with the king who triumphs. We know where history is heading. Verse 7. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Now, drinking by the brook is a picture of one determined to complete his task. Now, we've not yet reached that final day, but there's no doubt we will. One day, the king will lift up his head in complete triumph. Which then brings us back, doesn't it, to where we began in the first verse. Every enemy of this king will one day be crushed. And wonderfully, that includes death itself. Now, death is already defeated in Jesus' resurrection. But for now, his people, even his people, still die. That occasions much pain and sadness. But we know one day death will be no more. The king's people, that is us, we will enjoy resurrection life in full with our triumphal king. The king is dead, long live the king. That declaration was first made in France in 1422 when King Charles VII acceded to the throne upon the death of his father, King Charles VI. And the saying usually refers to two monarchs, obviously. But here at Easter, it speaks only of one. Yes, the king was dead. But that very same king is now alive forever. And Psalm 110 has shown us where he is. He is enthroned over all. The king rules. His enemies will not last. His people, us, offer ourselves freely to him, knowing that he's also our priest. He's done everything needed that we will be his holy people now and forever. And with that, we know how world history is going to play out. This king, our king, will triumph and will be there with him. Let's pray as we close. Our Father, we praise you that Jesus rose again from the dead, that he is now enthroned at your right hand. We praise you again for his death for us, to make us fit to be his people forever. And we praise you that he rules today, and that every enemy, including death, will be overcome. And so as we await that day, would you strengthen us to continue offering ourselves freely, in the service of our most glorious King. And in his name we pray. Amen.